there are some stories that might be evergreen stories. And then if we are going to tell an evergreen story, then we have to be upfront to say, this is an evergreen story. So mm -hmm. any breaking news or things might not get be told right now. Eventually they'll tell this story. They're interested, but it could take a little bit of time. Yeah. Welcome to Being Understood, a podcast where we explore what it means to be understood today and talk to the people who help clients do that. I am joined by my co-host, Bess. Hi, Bess. Hey, Liz. How are you? Great. How are you? Good. 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 It's a special day at Toonheim. It is. What is it? It's our 34th birthday. That's very exciting. We were not sitting here 34 <laughs> years ago, um, but our founder, Kathy Toonheim, and her original team of co-founders were, and we are luckily joined by a colleague who's been here a lot of those years, which is also very exciting. Yes. Thanks for joining us, Sandy. Sure. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. I'm excited to chat with you. Yeah. So let's start out by kind of backing your career up a little bit. So you're in communications now. You've worked in communications, as Liz said, for a long time. What did you start out doing and how did you get here? So I've been with Tunheim now for 31 years, which is almost 32. Amazing. Yeah. Yes. So almost, you know, I think there were 15 people here when I started. I started as a temp. I was a um, executive assistant. I had left my job as in a manufacturing company after I graduated college and uh, came here. I wanted to do something different and decided, you know, to try something. And I thought, man, yeah, okay, I'll come. And I was here for two weeks and they offered me the full-time position. And I said, sure. I really liked the people and thought this is kind of fun. And I did that job, and at that time, I think I supported the president of the company, which was Kathy Toonheim, and kind of evolved throughout the years. Um, and the company changed. It was growing and growing, and the role, my role continued to grow, and I did a lot of different jobs at the organization. I was off, I did some of the office management things. I sat at the front desk. I kind of dabbled in PR. I supported a lot of the like account supervisors and I was doing some work with a couple of the account supervisors and one of them had asked me at some point if I wanted to help with some media calls. Well, I'd never done that before. And, you know, I had done other things, you know, in some of the communications helped but I'd never done anything in media and they had asked me if I wanted to do that. So I thought, sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he gave me a few tips and, you know, par partial script and I started making some media calls and I started getting some success and they thought, wow, <laughs> this girl can sell a story. Mm -hmm. And I started doing more and more of it. And you know, the more you do, the more you want to do. So I started digging in a little bit more and started doing more and more on the PR side. And eventually, you know, probably five years into being here at the agency, I moved totally over into the PR and did a lot of media relations and communications and learned a lot. So it's been a, it's been a great ride. Wow. What is your favorite part of the work you're doing? Um, I don't know. I, I think it's changed over the years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I really do enjoy, you know, working with the media. There is something that is really, truly satisfying about getting that good story. So one of my favorite memories, I think, is my first Wall Street Journal hit, you know, that everybody wants to be on the Today Show or, or they want to get into the Wall Street Journal. We still hear that today. <laughs> yeah, we still do. Yeah. Everybody we wants the Today hear Show, yeah. right? Yeah. So, but I did, I worked for a, um, it was a rewards credit card. It was one of the first ones. Mm -hmm. And I placed the story in the Wall Street Journal and they actually framed that for me here at the agency. And it's in my office today. 
you know, and it's just kind of the thrill of getting the good story. So I think that's kind of some of the things I like to do. Yeah, which isn't always easy. So no, yeah, especially not. especially now with the way media has changed and all that. For sure. Um, obviously, it's changed a lot since you've been here. So <laughs> uh, what are some of the changes you've seen over the years? Oh, Lord, there's been a lot. Yeah. So, you know, um, when I started here, you know, we had internal email. We didn't have any external email. And a lot of what we did for media was via mail. <laughs> so, you know, we'd get a press release from the client and we'd put it on their letterhead and, you know, mail it out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if the client had a change at the last minute, then you'd be changing that and, you know, restuffing them. And there'd be a lot of times where it'd be three o'clock in the afternoon and you'd get the press release that said, oh, this needs to go out today. Oh, and so you're, you know, at the copy machine and you're copying them out and, you know, you're getting them all folded, stuffed, and then you've got to run the labels for the, you know, media list and, you know, getting Match them out. And, <laughs> right. And, you know, by that time, we've already missed the mail. So you have to drive to the airport, you know, to do <laughs> to, to get them out in the mail for that day. Yeah. Wow. So. But, you know, that that's a whole was, nother re, uh, thing behind mail merge, which anybody who does media relations now is familiar yeah. with the word version of mail merge. But in the, exactly in those days, you're actually matching things up and making sure your envelope is there were templates. The right like, there were templates, but they didn't always work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you had to do that. But, mm -hmm. you know. As I think we talked about, you know, this room that we're sitting in used to be a workroom and it had a big counter in it. Yeah. And, you know, um, it, it was an assembly line. You know, we did press kits and everything was mailed out, you know, so it just it was great when you know, email came out, actually when fax machines came out, <laughs> where fax machines were media were OK for you to fax things out. Yeah. You know. Um, that must have cut down a lot on time. I mean, if you were mailing your press release, you needed a few days before that story was right to uh, break versus um, facts was first way to be immediate, right? Right. Uh, I remember working in newsrooms and it was one of those things that I worked overnights quite a bit. So it was one of those things like when you get in, be sure to check the fax machine and be sure to check right. it all night just yeah. in case something comes in. So. I can imagine it just like you start hearing that beep noise <laughs> yep. and it's coming through yep. and you're like, oh, run, yep. run over the fax. And you've exactly. got that rolled paper. So you're cutting, the, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, but you've got the little fax papers on there and you're putting yeah. the, you know, you're writing the names and the phone numbers on and, you know, getting it out there. But it was a lot faster to get your breaking news out there yeah. than, you know, mailing them, you know, um, but we used Bacon's books too, for like the media lists. Mm -hmm. And then they came out with the CD version, which it wasn't really any better, except that you could, you know, run your labels from the CD version. They yeah. still weren't very, Huh. You know, they weren't, they were already outdated by the time you got them. So you're still calling media. I'm sure best in media, oh, in the yeah. newsroom, you probably got those calls. Yep. You need to verify <laughs> the media list. Oh, Is yeah. so-and-so still the news director? Yep. Mm -hmm. We you know, used to get those calls quite a bit. I'm sure our interns loved having to make those calls. I know yeah. I did a lot of those calls early on. You know, mm -hmm. you do that and they'd say, oh, when you sit at the front desk, that's a perfect thing to do. No, not really. No, no. <laughs> kind of monotonous, but important. That's getting Very. to the right people. We were also talking when we first sat down about clippings, oh. um, because when you got hits, obviously it, the client wants to see them. And today that's a near, it can be immediate if it's mm -hmm. posted on the web. Um, other times you want the actual newspaper article or you're looking for the TV um, clips and um there are different ways that we do that but it's near immediate yeah um but yeah. then you had a clipping service who would send you yes. all the clips and people would have to go through them and paste them in a book that yes. we would present <laughs> yeah they they had clipping services and you know we had some big clients so you would get boxes these boxes and 
you'd open the box and you'd like, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, and they'd be, they would, they'd be the cutout story from the newspaper. And sometimes they'd be stapled together because there's page one, you know, this was on page one and this was yeah. on, you know, page 15 or whatever. And you'd have to take them and glue stick them, you know, and put them on paper and pretty hole punch them and put them in a clip. Yeah, I can't even imagine how much time that would take. We had volumes wow. of clip books and, you know, you did a front page, you know, yeah. you'd want a cover page and you'd want to summarize all of the articles for the client so that they could <laughs> see them, you know, so that they knew what was in it. Yeah. You know, but it, again, times have changed yeah, a lot. Yeah. Thank goodness for technology. My gosh. Yeah. I, I mean, would you say the single thing that has changed the most and what you do is how much technology has continued to advance from when you started here to today. I mean, oh, I, I think sure. there have probably been 10 iterations of how you do all of these things in that time. Right. Um, and they just keep getting faster and For sure. I mean, advancing. I remember internet coming in mm -hmm. and one or two people had dial up you know, and that was a oh game God. changer. Yeah. You dial up internet. But you've never you know? sat there waiting for it. How right, have you right. ever lived? Right. <laughs> you know, but, you know, once that, once we got internet and, you know, you were able to, you know, the World Wide Web, you know, that we did all kinds of trainings on the World Wide Web, you oh know, and gosh. how that was going to change. And then newsrooms started to go online and, you know, you had reporters who, you know, were starting to say, okay, yeah, you can email me and mm -hmm. you can start to pitch via email. Well, that was a game changer mm -hmm. when you could start pitching via email because then, you could write your notes and you could get things out immediately. Yeah. And that's when breaking news could truly be breaking news. Yeah. If something was going on, you could, you know, send it out. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, I do think that is a game changer. And then, of course, social media came in and we had, of course, the Y2K scare, which was Oh, I can't even imagine. But I think we planned for, you know, I think it was a whole year we planned for Y2K and what if. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, it was nothing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. I recently watched a documentary on that and they said it's because so much planning went into it that nothing happened. Who knows? Um, but I do remember how scary <laughs> Y2K was to computers. You know, they were all going to blow up or yeah. whatever. <laughs> yeah, we weren't sure, you know, if you're going to come in the next day and everything was going to be there or if it was going to just, you yeah. know, yeah, be into oblivion. Maybe that's a good... Some days I'm getting a little overwhelmed by AI, and so maybe yeah. that's a good way to be like, you know what? There have been lots of these advances in our lifetime of, yeah. okay, just let things keep well, and playing I think out. I think social media and AI, there's a lot of similarities. Yeah. You know, I think the scariness of AI and the scariness of social media, I think there's a lot of similarities. Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, what if, although, I don't know, AI is can do so much more than what social media yeah. could. I think social media gave a lot more people a voice, mm -hmm. you know, which is, which I think is interesting and gave a lot of people to become their own media channel. Yeah. Which also brings some challenges too mm -hmm. for people in our exactly. field. So exactly. Yeah. You guys talk a little bit about that being on now on the same side, but both sides of that um, social media really revolutionized media. It mm -hmm. used to be you went to one source and then we had more than one source, but still there was a source of information. Obviously that's changed from the perspective of being in that, from an industry perspective, how has that changed how you share news for yeah. clients? I think uh, it's, it's interesting. I know that we talk here about, you know, you have your, the earned channels and you have your owned channels and they're both very important. I think on the own channels, you can share your messages and make sure that you can share the things. And yet earned, you want that third party credibility. 
And it's still yes. very important. And, you know, if, if you're thinking as a company, well, we have our own blog, we have our own social media channels, um, you know, we're doing our own YouTube videos. So we're, we, we have it covered. Earned media is still really important because it's third party credibility. And, you know, your audiences are looking at that, you know, if it's a daily newspaper and your customers are there or your key audiences are there, they're reading stories about your company. And it could be really important for them to read that story. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to put it, Sandy. And it's getting really hard to get that coverage. So I think it is even more rewarding when you are able to, you know, get that TV segment or the story in the newspaper. It is... Definitely, definitely harder, though, as newsrooms are shrinking, budget cuts, um, just, I mean, social media in general changes the way people consume news. So Mm -hmm. it's just it's interesting watching everything evolve and constantly change. It's not like things change and this is how it's going to be for the next couple months. It's daily things are changing in the world of media. Yeah, I think it's every day. And, you know, after covid so many media decided to leave. Mm-hmm. I think during COVID, after COVID, I think what it, what it was a stat that 50% of newsrooms lost their people either by, by layoffs or mm-hmm. by reporters choosing to do something else. Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah exactly. Exactly. <laughs> which I still have so many friends that continue to leave the business after they realize like, you know, work life balance is really important to people. And you yeah. don't get that in the media. Um, you're working really long days, really hard long days. And, you know, they realize that there is life outside of a newsroom and, yeah. you know, they're able to go do more things that they weren't able to do. And it's just, it's a different world. And once, you know, a lot of people realize that, like, it's just been it's been interesting watching some friends leave who I never in a million years would have thought would leave news because, you know, people who have been in it for a long time, like you, it's in your blood. And yeah, um, then they leave and it's like, wow, I don't know how I did that for so long. I could never go back. Yeah. Do you think there's anything also to <clears throat> as um, social media became more of a one to one channel where people were starting to get their news from other sources and. I hate to say it, but eroding the trust in news that there's a, why am I doing that, working this hard if people aren't trusting of this, um, which then I immediately want to counter with, we still need to have mm-hmm. <laughs> validation that the information that we're getting is accurate. But do you think there's a piece of that where there's a feeling of, Um, This isn't as appreciated as it once was. I think there is, but I don't know if that's necessarily a reason that a lot of people leave because I think it, it, they are very passionate about what they do and they believe in what they're doing and they see the importance of it. Mm -hmm. So good. Well, that's good. Yeah. 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 I think it's important. I think that's a good point though, that, you know, with when people can be their own media, Mm -hmm. Knowing what to trust, and we've all seen, you know, you have no idea if you're scrolling through, you know, Twitter or threads or Facebook or whatever, and you're reading stories and you're thinking, is that really true? Yeah. And you see, or you see somebody post something and you think, no, I know that's not true. Yeah. And you have to go validate it to make sure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so... I just think that that's it's hard for regular media outlets or traditional media outlets too, to, you know, they need to show their readers and their audiences that they are still a trusted source yeah. Yeah. and telling, you know, our, our clients too, these media people, they're still a trusted source, mm-hmm. but they are overworked and they're probably more overworked today than they ever were because these newsrooms are shrinking so badly yeah. that... You know, on a trade side of media, there might only be one or two people in a newsroom. Yeah. You know, and in a daily newspaper, all these people are doing multiple beats. It used to be that they had huge newsrooms and they had, you know, one person for the beats, two or three people for beats. And it's not true anymore. No. And like I look back at when I first started in TV, like I was a producer 
was my first full-time job. And like we had somebody who would make our graphics for us. We had somebody who cut our video. We um, were basically given the time to have creative freedom and write scripts and, you know, work with reporters on stories. And when I left just a couple of years ago, people were coming in and they're one man bands. Now they're shooting, writing, editing wow. all their own stories, multiple stories a day, doing live shots. And it's yeah. just crazy. And as a producer, I mean, you were doing everything now. You're making your own graphics. You're Some are cutting their own video for the stories and doing everything that it takes to put a newscast together. And wow. there's a lot of creative freedom that's gone now from the, mm-hmm. from the job, which definitely made it a lot less fun. Yeah. yeah. It's too bad. Um, yeah. How do you guys counsel your clients with this? Because obviously when we... Um, talk to a client. They want their story to be told. And I think the timelines are longer because making, because of all the reasons you're talking Mm -hmm. about um, making a case why this should be in the news up against whatever's breaking, whatever's happening nationally um, or in politics or whatever that is that tend to be much more um, on the daily How are you guiding clients with how this has changed so much? I think a big part of it is just being really honest with them about how hard it is to get media coverage and then um, working with them to figure out what is the newsworthy part of their story. And, you know, they might think it's one thing, but, you know, from our experience, we Mm -hmm. think it's another and just trying to help them understand that. Uh, I also think, too, like when they're expecting coverage from a story and let's say something breaking happens, helping them understand that this breaking news will always trump new other types of news or not always, I should say, but a lot of the times does tend to trump the type of news that, you know, we've sent a press release out or worked with a client on and just educating them on why it was that the story may not have run today or, um, you know, is being pushed back a week. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think in making sure that we're clear and helping them try to figure out what the best story angles are. Mm-hmm. And to where to tell point. it. Right. Because there are some stories that might be evergreen stories. And then if we are going to tell an evergreen story, then we have to be upfront to say, this is an evergreen story. So mm-hmm. any breaking news or things might not get be told right now. Eventually, they'll tell this story. They're interested, but it could take a little bit of time. Yeah. Yeah. So trying to find that news hook to be able to, Mm -hmm. you know, help tell that story faster. That'll be the best way to do that. Well, and are you guys also finding you might have to do a little bit more work on the storytelling angle of maybe that part's interesting, but if we could provide more background or additional materials or things like that, it'll make it easier for that story to be told. Oh, definitely. I think the more we can give journalists up front, whether it's, you know, video pictures, statistics, um, just facts in general, Mm -hmm. the more likely they are to cover stories because they don't have the time to sit and dig for all this stuff. And sometimes they don't have time to go shoot video that's, you know, 20 miles from where they're at. And so, It definitely does make a difference if we're able to Mm -hmm. basically hand them pretty much all the elements that they need, you know, already have interview um, subjects ready to talk to them. Um, Yeah, the more we can help them, the better. Yep. And be providing that any research and, you know, if we can provide them assets, infographics or, you know, any other assets that we might have to help tell that story that's already created, that's always really good, too. Mm -hmm. Well, I definitely always learn a lot from you guys about how <laughs> that ecosystem just continues to evolve. And um, I appreciate that you guys stay pushing how we evolve with it. Yeah. And obviously our jobs are very hard, very rewarding. What keeps yeah. you wanting to do what you're doing? Um, well, I love the people that I work with mm-hmm. and I'm not sucking up. <laughs> You're loved too. (laughs) Yeah. But, you know, it's, again, it's fulfilling. It's, it's fun. You know, one of my favorite things to do is to help a client maybe who has never done it before and you can build it from scratch. It's kind of fun. And I've had the opportunity to be able to do that a lot where I've got to work with somebody who's maybe never done any PR uh, media relations before. And you can kind of build that 
storytelling machine. Mm -hmm. And it's fun to watch them go from having, you know, nothing to, to watching it grow to, to be where their experts are in the media all the time. That's really fun. Mm -hmm. And it's really great for me to do. It's just kind of fulfilling for me to watch that happen. Yeah. Yeah. What is the challenge, though, when you're working with somebody who's never dealt with a PR agency, (laughs) um, who's working with one for the first time? Like, how do you what's the biggest challenge when trying to get them on board and believe in what you're trying to help them with? It can be difficult because they don't understand. Mm -hmm. You know, they they just think that we, you know, um, should be able to just get their story told. It's a good story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And usually, yeah, they're great stories. We just have to figure out how to tell them and trying to set those expectations up front to let them know and to educate. I think our job, you know, first and foremost is to educate our clients, to let them know, here's what we're going to do and here's how long it might take to do that. And, you know, the more assets we have, the more information we have and the best experts that we have are going to help us. So I think it's helping, I think it's helping our clients help us is probably the biggest assets that we have to be able to do that. If that makes sense. Yeah, it totally makes sense. sense. The theme of this podcast is being understood. And, um, what does that mean to you as somebody who's been doing this a long time and working directly with clients and helping them be understood? What does that mean to you? I think that we have a responsibility to help our clients be understood with whoever the audiences are. So for me, a lot of that is storytelling. It's helping my clients be understood in the media. It's, you know, making sure that if we're writing a piece that our client's point of view, our client's, you know, whatever it is that we're trying to tell the story, whatever piece of communication it is, that their point of view, that whatever the story we're trying to weave is there so that whoever reads it understands, you know, what we're trying to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't, you didn't talk about this part of your experience, but you were actually trained in a different um, industry, (laughs) which I think makes you especially strong at understanding more, um, uh, topics that are maybe a little bit harder to understand or a little more scientific or things like that and figuring out how to evolve them. Talk a little bit about how you bring your, um, that part of your mind to this work. Yeah, I, um, I went to engineering school, so, um, you know, I didn't go to, I'm not a communications, you know, I don't have a degree in communications. I, like I said, went to engineering school and I think you've been here long enough to have a degree (laughs) in communications. I mean, I've, like I said, I've grown up here and I've learned on the job, (laughs) Mm -hmm. I think, but that engineering degree. And like I said, I was in a manufacturing firm, um, early on in my career and, I learned that manufacturing and I understand how engineers work and how to work with engineers. And so I think a lot of the things that I did here was work with B2B companies and I understand them because I worked there and I understand the engineering part of it. So I think that's really helped me help these companies tell their stories. Yeah. You're really good at taking those technical topics and thinking about how to make them make sense to whatever media it is. It might be trade media where um, more of that technical piece can be part of it to more um, consumer driven or new business media where you need to make it even more simple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So obviously you've seen a lot of changes over the years. Where do you see the future of media Mm. relations, public relations being like, let's say five years down the road? Mm. Wow. (laughs) Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more um, play with AI. Mm -hmm. I think that there's no, right now where we are with AI, there's so many unknowns and, you know, you can't trust that, you know, what you're seeing in AI and what's generating in AI is, is actually accurate. But I think as the technology evolves and changes, I think we're going to find that it's going to be a better 
um, maybe a better helper for our jobs. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it'll be a better tool for us to use to be able to help develop communications, to pull in other research, you know, to be able to help tell our client stories. I also think that it'll be a great tool for our clients and for us to be able to help our, you know, put in there for our clients so that when people are looking for our clients information and AI will be able to, you know, um, give them correct information. Because right now we have no idea that if you put in a company name, if what you're pulling out is actually accurate. And I think we have a responsibility to our clients to be able to help them do that. Yeah. In the same way that SEO is an important part of what we do. Exactly. Writing for AI is also yeah. something that we've we are doing and continuing to explore, but it's still such early days that yeah, I think yeah. that will continue to. It might help you write evolve. a headline, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. or rewrite a headline, or help you get some ideas to write, you know, something, or be able to help a little bit. But you know, media people aren't using it. No, they're not. And actually, our colleague David Erickson and I. So David's spending a lot of time trying right. to figure out how you know, AI is going to impact our industry, how we can, you know, use it to help our clients and all that. Um, And David and I just did a presentation not too long ago. And part of it was talking about how the media is using AI. And I did a lot of research and they're really not. Yeah. Um, They might be using it, like you said, to come up with a headline or just come up with a few story ideas, like after they've put Mm -hmm. in like a current event and a few other facts and stuff. But um, it's still so far away from being something that journalists can fully rely on. And, you know, it doesn't have the emotion that humans bring to the table when, you know, like a journalist is writing a story. And so that's one of the big things where they're saying like AI is never going to replace a reporter. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They can't tell the story the way a person can tell the story. Yeah. And I don't know that they can ever get to that point. I don't know. Could. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it can, but at this point we're not there. And just facts in general. Right. So, I mean, <laughs> let's get there first. Yes, and then, right. And then, then let's we'll make sure talk. the information yeah. is right before yep. <laughs> it starts writing pieces. I know I, I like on when you're writing something on Microsoft Word now and you can check it for plagiarism. It's like, yeah. okay. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, yeah, there are a lot of things to be careful about, but it also, I mean, yeah, it does write a pretty good press release. So in that way, um, you know, right. I, I do think that we've all found ways to use it to support the work that we do while also being really careful and cautious mm-hmm. to make sure we're, I, I'm not saying that we're using it that way because yeah. I still think that we probably need to write them the way that we need them written. Right. And there's so many specific details, but I do know that there are PR firms that are swapping that out and having AI do a lot of writing. And you know, some of that's future leaning into that innovation. Some of yeah. it, I think we need to be really cognizant about because in a time of more misinformation and disinformation and spinning of stories that can be hard right. to follow, um, ensuring thoughtfulness and um, the, the heart of the story comes yeah. through and the creativity that, hum- right. that humans can bring um, are so important to be able to deliver. I think so too. And I, I'm not... I'm not at a point where I'm prepared to let AI write my news releases for me. No, I don't. <laughs> Did you guys see a couple of months ago, a few months ago when Match.com let AI write a press release and they sent it out and they were, they disclosed that it was written by AI, uh-huh. but still people were up in arms. And I think it was the first time like somebody's publicly said, like, I let AI do this and people didn't know what to do with it. Was it yeah. accurate? I think it was. I mean, yeah. Wow. Some, I mean, if it's, I guess, yeah, generation can be yeah. well written, but you got to double check. Facts. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. You have to double check the facts and then no hallucinations, please <laughs> disclose what you're yeah. doing too, because I don't think we would ever want to write a news release without disclosing to our clients that we did that because yes. we'd want to make sure that all of the information is accurate. Yeah, absolutely. And that anyone's comfortable with that. I know right. David plays with, um, use of AI generated imagery. And he does disclose right. that those are things that, um, 
you know, are interesting, but you also still have to be careful about because we want to make sure that you know who owns the image. Um, right. Where did it come from? What was it inspired by? Was that mm -hmm. stolen? I mean, there are just a lot of there are a lot of unknowns that we yeah. still have to work. I know there's a lot of but images it is fun. too that you see on your social channels too, and you look at those. You know, I think of some of these birds and stuff that you see, and you think, "Wow, are these even real? Yeah. I I don't know if they're real or not." Mm -hmm. You know, they you know they just don't look real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As part of the same presentation I just mentioned, David and I started out the presentation showing a series of pictures and then videos asking the audience, like, do you think this is real or do you think this oh, is fun. AI? And it was probably about half and half wow. thought they were real, half thought they were fake throughout yeah. the whole thing. And it, they were all AI generated. They were all ones David had created. So wow. it was just interesting because people couldn't tell. I mean, yeah. even the videos. Yeah. But then like the last video we showed, it was a scene from my camera well, probably some made up place, but the only way you could tell it was fake is all of a sudden people were disappearing or like walking into walls and disappearing. And so once we pointed that out to folks that it, it was very obvious, it was AI generated, but unless you pay attention to the small little mm -hmm. details in a lot of them, you can't tell. Wow. Just scary. Fascinating. <laughs> yeah, it is. The technology is, it is really interesting yet very terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, from the start of your career here, where everything was completely curated and right. high, high touch to a time when there's an expectation of use of technology to make things faster and quicker, but we're still very high touch and very focused on results. Um, and with that comes still a uh, high regard for making sure things are done well. And yeah, so it, right. it is in your work lifetime, there's just been a massive amount of transport transformation. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, the, it's funny because I think from the beginning of time, we've always talked about change at two mm -hmm. and this company has evolved many, many times over time. We've, you know, done things differently and transformed and continue to move with the times. And, you know, so it's, it's been exciting. It's been really interesting to kind of be here all of this time and to be able to share, you know, all, all throughout the whole journey. It's just been really cool. I know I always enjoy chatting with you about this stuff <laughs> and learning from you. So, well, and you're a key part of that because you've yep. provided that kind of a place where it's okay to keep evolving yeah. and keep learning. Um, and I think being results driven does that in a lot of ways. When sure. we want to see results, then we're willing to lean in and say, "Okay, how can we do this differently?" But um, you certainly are a great leader in that and bringing people along in that. Thank you. Yeah. And we love working with Sandy. Yes. <laughs> so I got asked this question the other day. Mm -hmm. um, someone has a daughter who is wanting to go into PR and they said, what advice would you give her? Mm -hmm. She's 14. Question. So wow. I'm curious to hear what you would give somebody who is, I mean, they could be college age wanting mm -hmm. to go into PR. What, what advice would you give them? I would, I would say that if they're truly interested that they should do an internship for one thing so that they can learn. And honestly, I would definitely at, tell them if they do an internship to go to an agency, not just because I've been in an agency, but because at an agency, you get to touch a lot of different things. There's so many different clients. There's so many different things that you can do and touch and you can get a feel for what you want to do. So whether or not, you know, you like B2B or you like consumer, you like the social and digital, there's just a lot of different things that they can do. And also talk to people, do some informational interviews mm -hmm. beforehand, talk to people who do it, find out what they like about it. And if nothing else, if you're really not sure, see if you can shadow somebody. Mm -hmm. Go to somebody's work that does PR, whether it's an agency or, you know, at a corporation and just, you know, see if you can shadow them and ask a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's great. That's better that's great advice answer. than what I would get when I was looking to go into TV and would ask people for advice. <laughs> They're like, don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> no, don't do it. If we you want to make that. no money and work all the time, go into TV. So thank you for that. That's very good. Very <laughs> oh. good advice. Well, we'd... Enjoy having this 
student or any student yes. as an intern to train and yeah. get their ideas too. Cause that's, the, that's the other part that I think is fun right now. Um, with all of this technological advancement, we have an opportunity to learn. Well, we are very focused on the stakeholders who are critical to the success of any particular client, which is going to be different across the board. And so right. if for a client, a younger generation is a key audience, we have to communicate differently than we would if we're talking to an older audience. And that's mm-hmm. makes it both fun and um, got to keep leaning in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's exactly. always great to have younger people come in and, you know, learn from them because yeah. they've, know far more than what I do. <laughs> well, Keeps you know us young. <laughs> yes. Okay. So one thing we always like to ask our guests that come on is to tell us a fun fact that people might not know about you. If you can't think of one people don't know, it's okay to say one that maybe Liz and I know about you, but what, what's something fun that you um, share? Well, there's a couple, but maybe one that you guys probably know about me, but maybe a lot of other people don't know is I actually... Um, have have been involved in a car club. My husband and I have a Corvette and have had a few different Corvettes over the years, but we yeah. do have a new Corvette and we are having a ball driving with a group of friends. So we yeah. like to go out and we just got back from a trip to Two Harbors with about 25 of our friends. So Yeah, your pictures were beautiful from up there. (laughs) What's your favorite trip you've taken with the club? Um, We went down to um, Kentucky. Wow. Through mountains. And yeah, it was, that was really fun. So cool. Went to the Corvette Museum, of course. Of course. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. And it's awesome that it's something that you two share as well. Yeah. Something you both enjoy. It's fun. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have to ask, what's the other one that you're going to tell us? Oh, I, I really enjoy like, um, cooking different types of recipes, taking Ooh. recipes and making them my own. How fun. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm kind of a food network junkie, mm-hmm. you know, I like watching those shows and Good looking choice. at all the different, you know, recipes that they cook and kind of figure out what I would do if I was cooking. Yeah. So. Well, and it's fun cause you've got family close by too, so they can all enjoy it all with you. Yeah. yeah. So. It's kind of fun. Good. Do we have a future chopped champion or anything? No, here? No? no. Okay. Well, no, just in my own yes. kitchen. <laughs> I appreciate that too. Me too. <laughs> yeah. But yours is probably better. So that's awesome. <laughs> thanks, Sandy. Yes. Thanks for yeah. joining us, Sandy. Sure. Thanks for having me.